Have you ever put your name into Google followed by the words the hedgehog and had a look at the image results? Don't do it. Hi, I'm Vince, also known as Pleasant Kenobi on the internet, and I'm often cited as being the magic content creating equivalent of the Sonic fandom. <laughs> Happy birthday, Sonic! Many of you all know that I love me some Death and Taxes, and I have been feeling that the standard mono white variant in Legacy has been a bit of a dog to the four color Leovold decks that have risen in popularity since the Elf with the Shelf showed up. However, I have since been told of a three step plan to defeat the four color menace. Step 1 Play Magus to the Moon. Step 2 Wreck Bitches. Step 3 Profit. It is a simple and straightforward plan that even I can follow, so let's take a look at the red-white variant of Death and Taxes in Legacy. The deck list is pretty straightforward, we take your usual mono-white list and trim some numbers on Mother of Runes and Revoker, as well as cut the flex slots of Avenger and Sanctum Prelate, this gives us some room for the red goodies. Primary draw of red is Magus of the Moon, but Mum and Pup's one-stop thought the shop is also a big draw to the archetype. We also get to mess with some new hotness from Rivals of Ixalan in the form of Dire Fleet Daredevil. This little man allows us to do all sorts of silly things, from stealing our opponent's pushes and bolts to allowing us to brainstorm and shuffle our deck with a recruiter in Magical Christmas Land. A 2-1 for a striking body is fine, with the added weird utility being all gravy baby. The mana base includes some fetch lands to allow us to find plateaus or fetch planes against wasteland based decks, whilst Cavern is perfect on human as it allows us to cast all of our red cards and the majority of our white ones. Cunning Spark Mage in the board is a mirror breaker that allows us to vaporize the usual assortment of X1s found in Death and Taxes, as well as deal with things like Empty the Warrens and Lingering Souls tokens. Whilst this variant deck allows us to punish greedy multicolored mana bases more than usual, it does make us significantly softer to cards like Wasteland, as well as making us softer to Fire and Ice as a collection of our creatures can't even block the fucking thing. And now, history lessons with Pleasant Kenobi. Historically, the red-white version was called Imperial Taxes due to the utilisation of the ever-expensive Imperial Recruiter to fetch up your silver bullets. Personally, I don't like calling it Imperial Taxes. As a three-quarters white British man, there simply isn't enough tea drinking, cricket teaching and spice stealing from indigenous people to be able to call it a real Imperial Pursuit. If we are committed to that naming convention, which we aren't anymore because Recruit of the Guard eliminated the need for Imperial Recruiter, then I much prefer the term White Guilt and Taxes, as it's a double pun on the usual base white elements of the archetype, as well as making fun of some of our own White Guilt. Ha ha ha! Woo hoo hoo! Colonialism! Isn't it lighthearted fun, kids? I personally prefer the name Blood and Taxes, as it sounds more like a brutal death metal band. <laughs> Or, worst case scenario, an attempt at a brutal death metal band with some kids with shit haircuts and tight jeans. Before any of you say anything because you think you're fucking smart, the reason this video itself is named as it is is because I'm at the mercy of metadata and popularly used search terminology. But with that said, if I cared that much, I should probably mention Jake and Logan Paul in the video title too, as well as the death of magic. A big shout out to my biggest patrons who are all scrolling past now, I fucking love your support so thank you for keeping the channel going, and don't forget you can support the channel whilst feeding your own cardboard crack addictions by using my discount code with my sponsors, MTGO Traders for digital product and Cape Fear Games for the physical. Use the discount code GGGetWrecked and it'll make me feel all warm and fuzzy inside my stomach area. Round 1 we mulligan away at a slow 7 with no action that has just our solitary 4 and 5 drops. We only play one of each of those size cards and of course we have to draw them together in our opening hands. We get a weak 6 that depends on the vial to work and needs a third land. The bat skull basically makes it a 5 so I decide it is better than a 5 and keep it. In my recent games in Modern Red Stompy Prison I have faced other Stompy decks and show and tell variants approximately 40% of the time across two leagues. It seems like Blood Sun is really making people want to play City of Traitors again. This makes our vial and fire eyes very strong here if we get one of those matchups. Of of course, I'm going to put it on a blue deck though because that's why I like Dotal and my Vile gets forced. It is game over from that point as my opponent deploys Delvers, flips them, and at that point I get a white source to start making headway on the board. It's just too late. A fort bot makes short work of the Guardian throbbing, and I am dead. We effectively lost the game uh, on turn one, or probably even earlier as I kept that hand because it was just too soft to force. GG got forced. Game 2. We keep a Suspect 7. Batskull is a needy little bitch that wants to be in my fucking hand at all times. What a c**. 
cunt. I have Wastelands and Plowshare, which is good for this matchup. I just need a red source or white creature to get a board position. We draw a Heath and opt to Wasteland my opponent prior to playing a creature to test if he kept a land light hand. He plays an Underground Sea and deploys a Deathlight Shaman. We crack our fetch, grab a plateau, and plow that dirty little elf. I play a Jitte, wanting to get the most out of my Ben Affleck's Man Without Fear by playing it with Mana Up to play one of his Brainstorms or Ponders. A Brainstorm on effects line later, our opponent plays his first Delver of the game. I play a Daredevil and cast the Ponder out of his bin. I see an assortment of cards, all of which are mildly useful, but with a Pia and Scarlet in my hand, I want to hit land drops where I can. I shuffle and then I draw a Caracas, which is kind of a land drop. It's halfway there. Whoa. Living on a prayer. Delver doesn't flip, but a Ponder finds a Diabolic Edict and Ben Affleck eats the dust. I play a Thalia with Caracas protection. He flips his Delver and slams a really big fish. We draw another Stoneforge Mystic. I have the option of equipping Jitte and blocking first strike to get counters and then bouncing with Caracas, which would kill a Delver. However, I think that removal would be too much of a speed bump here, and the current board state is a bit hairy at best. Uh, a speed bump could probably give them enough time to just kill me. I play Stoneforge instead, get Sword of Fire and Ice, and wonder if all hope is lost at this point anyway. End of turn, Dismember puts the writing on the wall and confirms that I would have just got blown out by removal anyway. He swings, and I go to seven. He plays a Deathlight Shaman. I draw a path, and after a lot of contemplation, I bath his Delver. When when his fish attacks, I look to buy time with a bat skull block, but he double bolts and activates Death White Shaman in response. What on earth am I meant to do against that fucking draw? My draws felt pretty rough, and in hindsight, I should have mulliganed a bit more aggressively, but his draws were really strong as well, so it's hard to say. Round two. My opponent plays nothing in his opening turn. Nothing. 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 Tra la la. We play a vial. He plays nothing again. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. You get nothing. We play Stoneforge Mystic. Our opponent costs a petal, then summons packs for Wild Cantor. Oh no, it's fucking Belcher. Rip. He exiles an Elvish Spirit Guide to cast the tutored Cantor. He dark riches off of the petal, then sacks Cantor for blue. He then casts a, a Slither Muse? Tape Worm thing? And then, when it leaves play as it was evoked, he draws him back to six cards, and then he concedes. Good game, good game. That was fun magic. He turned one land grants for a Bayou. Wait a fucking minute. This ain't no Belcher. Let me just check my deep well of meta understanding and knowledge. Holy shit. Nobody, and I mean nobody, expects the Spanish Inquisition. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Our chief weapon is surprise. Surprise and fear. Fear and surprise are two weapons. Our fear and Turn one combo. Land Grant fetches up Bayou. Bayou allows him to cast Dark Ritual, which he then casts Cruel Bargain with, and then he passes the turn. I play a fetch land and pass back. He land grants for what might possibly be his only other land, a dried arbor. He sacrifices it to Culling of the Week to make four black mana. Dark Petition with Spell Mastery is cast. He uses the mana to draw four more cards from a second copy of Infernal Contract. He plays a Lion's Eye Diamond. This means I'm probably dead, but he needs a little bit more mana to be able to crack the LED, cast the Passing Flames from his bin, and continue to combo off with the Witches in his bin. All he really needs is some Petals or Spirit Guides in hand, and I am dead as fuck. There is a dramatic pause. He passes the turn. I play Ether Swan Cannonist. It is over. The storm has passed, the sun has come out, and our opponent has conceded. GG Cannon Knee. Round 3. I keep a very slow, pretty bad 7. Part of me wants to mulligan, but I allow recent events to create a bias. I think to myself, my mulligans would just be as bad anyway, so fuck it, right? Welcome to Pleasant Kenobi's Tilt Yourself Into a Hole, featuring this rough as fuck 7 card hand. Pre game, he reveals a chance on the annex, which means we're just fucking dead here. This hand is dire against both Reanimator and Dredge. He loots the Chancellor into the bin, plays a Chrome Mox, and casts Dark Ritual into Animate Dead. On the upside, he has very few cards left in hand, so if I can deal with this before he has a chance to restock, we might have a game. 
I draw Swords of the Plowshares, which is fantastic here, but I have to play around the chance attacks too. He hits me, does nothing, I crack my fetch in the end step because I'm a modern playing scrub. He entombs in response to avoid a pierce or foster storm or days in case I'm playing Miracle or Delver or something. I play another land and pass, and he attacks after a looting. I go to plow, forgetting that there are two triggers one for pre game effects and one from the on battlefield chancellor. I can't pay enough and lose my plowsheds as it's countered. I feel silly for missing that. I'm really out of practice at the moment, and I'm just generally quite bad at the game. I get hit in the face. I draw a card I can play and cast Stoneforge Mystic. I really want to flicker the mox with an empty hand and blow up the land, but I also need to figure out a way to play through the Chancellor and blow up my lands is not the way to do that. I set up Battle Skull with a plan of allowing it to mitigate all the damage he's doing and buy me some time. I have to pray he doesn't draw a reanimation spell at this point. I wasteland him off red and he goes to reanimate Elishnor in his main phase. I have to activate Stoneforge Mystic before she dies and make a 2 2 Battle Skull. Be afraid. I get hit to one, draw useless magus and concede. Okay, game two. My opener has a rest in peace. Oh boy. We play our planes and pass. He plays his petal. We clench for a moment. 5p territory. No one mask or duress. One time please. One time dealer. He passes. We are through. We play another planes and we slam that rest in peace. On his turn, he plays nothing. Oh baby. Oh baby baby. Yeah baby. We play a needle on Big Daddy Grizz and slam a Stoneforge Mystic into play. I shoot for Fire and Ice in order to go for Carnivage over life in order to draw more hate if needed. He exiles a black card from his hand, casts a mask to get rid of my sword, and then concedes. GG, game three. We have a hand with Rest in Peace, Caracas, and a one drop to throw into any Chancellor pregame effects that we can actually resolve rip on turn two. He dresses our rip. <laughs> oh boy. I fire a Vile through the Chancellor so that I can resolve this Thalia ASAP. He therapies a Grizzy into his bin, but he doesn't make another land drop. He has reanimate in hand. So with another land, he can reanimate through Thalia anyway, and then draw into enough lands to continue to play the game through her if we bounce the Grizzy. Bearing in mind that Thalia also turns off the lines of Petal or Dark Ritual enabling off top deck as well. I decide to spend the turn casting a needle on Grizzlebrand and keeping up Caracas in case he somehow makes an Elish or Iona next turn. Personally, I am terrified of the Arc Cup that's in his hand right now that we can see because of Cabal Therapy. That card is bad news for DNT. I believe he's trying to reanimate Grizzlebrand, draw seven cards, ditch the archetype and then reanimate that as well. That is his plan. He misses another land drop. Keeping a one land against death and taxes is pretty rough to be honest, but the Duress Swamp reanimate Grizzly Hand does seem tempting. I'll give him that. He consumes a chance slow in response to my Thalia because it is Caracas proof. Our Magus the Moon is pretty useless in this matchup here as it would turn off our Caracas so I probably should have boarded them out. We recruit a four Palace Jailer on turn four in order to have another answer to reanimate creatures along the path in our hand. He goes to cast something, realises he can't and passes. We draw and play a Sanctum Prelate on two in order to ensure that Exhum and Animate Dead are not options at any point during this game, meaning that reanimate will cost him the game to the life loss and he concedes. We keep a hand with ports, wasteland and some action, this is fine if a little bit slow and unexciting. Our opponent leads turn 1 Delver, which I play an uncontested stone forward Mystic into on turn 2. Expecting the bolt, I opt for Chitte to avoid having Battle Skull stranded in my hand for the rest of the fucking game, like all the other games where I've fucking drawn it. Fuck you, Battle Skull, you fuck! He blind flips the Delver, plays another Delver and wastelands my wasteland. He blind flips another Delver because it's better to be lucky than good at this game and in life. I make a Chitte on end step and simply have to pray he doesn't have it. Of course he has it, he bolts my stone forward in combat and I lose lose the fucking game. The better line would have probably been to play the Moon Crusader here, allowing me to have two potential equipped next turn, which plays around a single piece of removal. That was a mistake. I do to seven that does absolutely nothing, get a six that does next to nothing, and go to five. The five is keepable, but I have to pray to fucking god he doesn't have a wasteland at this point. I stupidly leave with my soul white source, which was completely incorrect, which means that if he has a wasteland, I lose. He has a wasteland. I lose. I draw four one drop white spells in a row to add insult to fucking injury. If I had sequenced my lands correctly, there is a good chance that I would have had four presents at this point, two Mother of Runes, and a way to interact with his Delvers, or in this case, his Death White Shaman through Swords to Plowshare. I also learned the hard way that playing fetches to splash red means I am softer to stifle. Fuck. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again
There was a fifth game where the Red Splash was almost good and I managed to play Pia and Kieran and then bounce them with Crackers to replay them and then bounce them with Crackers to replay them. I think I played them three times in total. However, no matter how good that sounds against Dead Kai Air and other mid-range matchups, I lose because he drew more Stoneforge Mystics than me and more equipment than I did. Would you look at that? Oh baby, a triple! This league was too much of a small sample size to really decide whether or not the Red Splash is worth it. I'll try some more with it before deciding to play at the British Legacy GP in May. I think I made some rather minor mistakes that are of course exasperated and punished harder in such a rough format like Legacy. To really perform as the top decks, you have to play DNT tight, and that is not what I did in this league. I need to work on my middle game, game and I need to sequence better. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to comment with your favourite bits and what you want to see more of in the future. If you really don't have much to share, then feel free just to tell John to fuck off because he deserves it. Like the video too as it helps with my user engagement and getting the video promoted through YouTube. If you want to support the channel directly, click through to help me via Patreon and make sure you're subscribed to me on YouTube. If you want to support the channel indirectly then be sure to buy your cards from MTGO Traders for Digital and Kate Fair Games for Physical and use my discount code found in the description below. And until next time, I'll leave you with some wise words from a wise man. Here is Digital Gandhi. If you are ever doubting your own creative decisions, just remember that someone thought it a good idea to have Sonic the Hedgehog engage in a romantic relationship with a human girl. Every day, we drift further from God.